Hi, I'm Tracy Watts. Welcome to Mercer Health News. The topic today is mental health. I've invited two of my colleagues to join us to talk about the latest developments in the area of mental health support for both the commercial and the government sector. Laura Nelson is joining us. She is a board certified psychiatrist with experience ranging from direct care within the inpatient and the outpatient settings. She's also served in state level executive leadership positions and is a principal in our government consulting practice. Welcome, Laura. Thank you, Tracy. It's great to be here. Also joining us is Mary Kay O'Neill. Mary Kay is a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician, and she did her clinical work and ran the rehab program at Virginia Mason Medical Center. She also was the medical director for the Washington State Employees Program and for a health plan. Um, she's a partner in our total health management specialty practice. So Mary Kay, welcome. Really happy to have both of you ladies here today. Thanks, Tracy. Glad to be here. So to start off, let's address the big issue as it relates to the support for behavioral care, and that is access to care. So Mary Kay, what are the best practices that you're seeing employers implement to provide better access to behavioral health care? That's a really big question, Tracy, but I have to say I'm very impressed with many of our clients working hard to solve this problem. I think everybody knows we have a workforce shortage in terms of psychiatrists and psychologists and, and mental health counselors, but we have had an explosion even before the pandemic of people providing this kind of care through virtual means, telehealth, behavioral health practices, and things like that, which I think holds a lot of promise for many reasons. Um, it helps people access care when they are available to actually do the work, uh, and it makes it much more efficient in many respects. But we're still struggling with a workforce shortage, particularly around needs for kids or, or very specialized care. And I think that the other thing that really has helped a lot isn't so much just putting the services out there, but there's an increasing uh, willingness to be more straightforward about how common these problems are for many of us and to to do everything we can to hook people up with these services that really make a big difference. You know, I think that's true. I mean, it, it, when we talk about the silver linings of the pandemic, one of them certainly is the awareness of the need for behavioral health care and the openness to to be able to ask for it. Um, but what about um, integration in with the medical care that is provided? It seems like you've been doing a lot of work in that area. Yeah, this isn't a new topic for me and for many people, actually. But I think, you know, through the last number of years, as we've been trying to look at high quality medical care and models such as the ACO uh, model of care for people, and now we're all talking about advanced primary care and if you're really going to do advanced primary care and have the relationship with individuals, you must be looking for behavioral health issues that they're struggling with and connecting people with the resources that will really have an impact on their health and their lives. So there's also, you know, an increasing emphasis on behavioral screening for people going through pregnancy and post-delivery. There's increased uh, awareness of how frequently behavioral health issues accompany major cardiac events. So you can't just put it off in a corner somewhere. It has to really be, you have to be screening for it just like you would high blood pressure or whatever else, because that is what's up. And I, and one of the downsides of the pandemic is that we're at about 40, 50% of our population has some identifiable behavioral health condition right now. So it's totally normal, <laughs> totally normal, but we need to help people understand what's happening to them, understand what their way forward is, and, and make it clear that there really is help to, to make things better. Yeah, and having that primary care physician immediately make that contact, not just here's a phone number, call and see when you can get in, but just making it happen right then. Um, so Laura, what is different and what works in the state Medicaid programs? What, what we really want to know is if you have any tips or advice or new ideas for employers to consider. 
Yeah, thanks, Tracy. And I totally echo what uh, Mary Kay just said. I think what we're seeing a lot in Medicaid is a huge increase in the use of telehealth services. We know many states are also looking at policies to allow them to really keep many of the flexibilities that they've had during the pandemic. So I see that as a, a real plus. Uh, certainly in Medicaid, there's been an emphasis on integration as well. We are seeing a lot of primary care offices that are bringing behavioral health providers into to their clinics to be available for warm handoffs. But I think some of the things that perhaps might be a little different in Medicaid, um, we do have many states that will cover, for example, non-emergency medical transportation to really help individuals get to those offices and those appointments that they've been able to schedule. But one of the biggest challenges I think that um, that we all face really is around the workforce. And in Medicaid, we see a lot of use of non-licensed providers. And we have um, licensed and accredited behavioral health agencies that will staff up with maybe master's level clinicians or uh, certified peer support specialists or certified chemical dependency counselors. And all of those types of staff really serve as staff extenders, if you will, to the typical traditional psychiatrists and psychologists that are often the go-to when it comes to behavioral health services. And these are staff that are supervised and, and, and trained by, by licensed clinicians, but they truly help with some of the engagement and the, the recovery supports that individuals would benefit from. And so, Laura, are those extended resources, are those really only available in person or is there the potential for us to greatly expand virtual care access by leveraging a broader range of providers? Absolutely. And I think that's what we're going to be seeing in terms of some policy changes at the state level to really mm -hmm. keep the flexibilities that, that we've proven now um, have been very helpful, keeping in mind that some individuals will prefer in-person visits, or maybe there's a hybrid model where maybe you have some virtual visits occasionally and then some in-person visits as well. It really needs to be what uh, is, is most desired by the individual who's seeking treatment. So that is really interesting. It's a creative way to address the access issue by being more open to the types of people that can provide these services and giving them the training to be able to do it effectively. So very, very good suggestion there. Um, so Laura, will you talk about the mobile crisis units and the new 988 program, this National Suicide Prevention Hotline? Um, share with us what you know and, and what we should be aware of. Sure. Let, let me start by saying, and Mary Kay hit on this a little while ago, that the, the prevalence of mental health conditions and, and the suicide rate has just continued to go up. So it's, it's a growing national uh, public health emergency that we need to be prepared for. So to, to your question about 988 and mobile teams, and that actually reminds me of other ways that Medicaid, I think, has stepped up to try to increase access to care. But 988 is going to be transformational when it comes to um, behavioral health services and access to services in this country. Most people are familiar with 911 as being the universal number you call in a medical emergency. And I think many people will call 911 when they're experiencing a behavioral health crisis. What that typically leads to, however, is an ambulance and EMT showing up at your house or maybe even the police. Oftentimes that then leads to a transport to an emergency department and then even an inpatient admission perhaps. So what's going to happen with the rollout of 988 is hopefully people will be very familiar with an alternative number to call when they're experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Instead of 911, they'll call 988. These calls will automatically be answered by crisis call centers, hopefully one close in your area. That's the idea. You would be connected to one that's nearby. Findings suggest that these calls can be resolved 80% of the time just by talking to someone on the phone. So there's no need for any other intervention. Um, however, not all of them are. And so what we see, and this is where Medicaid comes in, I think, is we're seeing many states that are developing pretty robust mobile crisis response teams. And so the crisis call center has the capability to dispatch a mobile team to where the individual is to try to resolve the, the crisis in the field. And about 70% of the time when these teams are dispatched, they are able to do just that. 
Uh, and in those situations where they're not able to feel that the situation has been resolved, they may then transport the individual to an emergency department if that's the only other level of care that's available in the community. Or what we're seeing states really start to bring up today are crisis stabilization centers. And so these are alternatives to emergency departments where someone could be transported and they could stay for up to 24 hours or potentially even up to a few days. Uh, again, specifically focused on trying to stabilize the behavioral health needs. That is really interesting. You know, the one question I have is how does this get paid for? That's a great question. And so, well, naturally, many people that call a hotline for support, no one's going to be asking them if they have insurance or if they're on Medicaid or anything like that. Um, and so the vast, the vast amount of time, those kinds of, of interventions are covered with state dollars or taxpayer dollars. However, when we start talking about a, a, a mobile crisis response or a crisis stabilization type of, of setting, in many states now, Medicaid is paying for those services. And in fact, there's a pretty significant investment that's happening now at the federal level to encourage states to cover mobile crisis teams with their Medicaid programs. And so clearly there's this investment and this appreciation of, of mobile crisis services as being part of a, a good, robust benefit package. So Mary Kay, I know you've been a medical director for state programs and commercial programs. So what advice do you have for our employer audience about 988? Well, first, um, this is a very exciting development and one that's that's been needed for a long time. So I, I think the first piece of advice is to educate yourself about what this is and to think about just a communication plan throughout your organization so people know that this is coming online next June. Uh, I think the other thing that uh, Laura has brought up that's so interesting is to understand how this uh, service and these, this, you know, the patient needs that have been identified have been addressed by Medicaid and to see where this applies to the commercial population. I have been a medical director looking at lots and lots of claims data on the commercial side and most 911 calls themselves don't you know, translate into a bill to the individual or the employer. Those services are a public good that is covered by tax dollars. But of course, if somebody is then transported into a setting where clinical care is delivered, this may very well hit the claims. So I think that we all need to be talking to our carriers about how these crisis stabilization centers may be looked upon as an in-network behavioral health facility. And so we're ready to go with that because we don't want to surprise people, <laughs> you know, with billing that we don't anticipate, or as Laura was talking about earlier, if it's a kind of facility that that plans aren't used to even thinking about, they need to approach it as how they would bring somebody in network. So I, I think those are a couple of the issues, but I'm very excited that that this is in evolution. And I think we're it's going to be of huge value. And we're all going to continue to learn a lot more about behavioral health by having this system in place. Okay. Well, certainly awareness of 988 is a really good first step to mm -hmm. figuring out um, what to do next. So, um, you know, I'd like to switch gears and talk about quality as it relates to behavioral health. Um, we certainly have covered the access issues and those are still pretty big. We are um, embarking on access to transparency data as it relates to the cost of various types of care. And so it just seems only natural to think about what do we know about the quality of behavioral health care? So Mary Kay, for employer-sponsored coverage, how is quality measured or how should it be measured for this type of care? Oh, that is a fabulous question. So I think that, you know, our evolution about how we provide these services and we've sort of kept it over to the side and we've had shortages of providers and networks. So we're just like, oh, please join our network that we have been very late to the quality game on behavioral health. Um, it's also you know, there's not the standards that we sort of have in medicine about what quality looks like or how it's tracked. Um, a lot of the quality in, in behavioral health has to do with the engagement between the, the provider and the, the patient, much more than like which school of therapy they're following and whatnot. 
So there are emerging ways that um, this kind of quality can be evaluated, but I don't think any of them are mainstream yet. I know, for example, the department at University of Washington is looking at how to how to not only coach their people to be really good, but to oversee if they're really engaging with people and making a difference in their lives. Um, but for others, I think there are issues, you know, there's larger measures like if they're put on a medication, are they complying and sticking with it? Um, if they have been uh, hospitalized or put into a treatment center of some kind, you know, how, how supported are they in the early, um, really, you know, post-discharge or recovery state and, are, are they connected with services that keep them on the path to in improving health and uh, the ability to participate, particularly in the commercial world with work and family and things like that. But um, so I think this is an emerging area. And I think people are so like, oh, just just we need more people that, that they've been, unfortunately, not as rigorous, I think, as they could be. But I'd be delighted to hear what Laura thinks about this. Yeah, so Laura, how do the state Medicaid programs monitor the quality of these services? Well, first of all, there are a lot of federal regulations that come along with Medicaid that states are bound to um, because the federal government does chip in part of the payment for, mm -hmm. for Medicaid services. It is very common for state agencies to include pretty significant performance measure expectations in their contracts with their health plans. Uh, as Mary Kay said, many times the, the performance measures that are being looked at are, are national measures. They're oftentimes more process or oriented rather than outcome oriented. You know, are you following up after discharge from an inpatient hospital? But what we do see um, on the Medicaid side is they do try to put some, some teeth into it. Oftentimes, if it's a capitated program, for example, managed care, the state may do a performance withhold and say, we're going to hold back this a little bit of your capitation until you show that you're able to reach this threshold in various performance measures, and then you would earn that back. They may even also go higher to say, you can also earn an incentive above that if you meet like a target goal where you really are able to push the performance even higher. Lastly, I would say that, that states are really getting into value-based purchasing arrangements now with their providers. Mm -hmm. States are pushing their managed care plans to take that, that um, risk-based arrangement down to the provider level. Mm -hmm. uh, like they've done on the physical health side, I think with a little bit more ease, definitely has been more of a challenge with behavioral health. Um, sometimes the providers are um, they're a little farther behind with maybe some of their electronic health records and their ability to track some of the data that's needed to go along with those arrangements. But we're starting to see some real movement there and it's exciting. Wow, so some interesting developments there. Um, well, I just wanna thank both of you for joining me today. This has been such an interesting discussion around mental health. We certainly um, talked about access and got some really neat ideas about ways to perhaps expand the number and type of providers that people have access to on the commercial side. The 988 conversation was very enlightening and um, we have some awareness there and some things to do and probably a little bit of work to do in the quality area. So um, thank you both for coming and, and sharing your expertise and everyone, we look forward to um, seeing you again on Mercer Health News. <laughs>